When we make money from trading futures and commodities, and when we provide services to this part of the financial sector, as I do, sometimes we get lost in the now of trading. We may wonder and speculate about the direction of tomorrow's trends, and ponder through what existential medium, usually computer-based these days, that we shall adopt to study our trades. Rarely, however, do we give thought to the historical interactions of our predecessors and the places that they frequented to do their business. What was the environment like where they stood? What of their daily routines and disciplines? As, just like us, they too channeled independent pathways in their quest to shape their own dreams and desires. What is fascinating is the immense international history of exchanges and markets that have been in existence for hundreds and in some cases thousands of years, and of great interest is by what measure they used to justify and quantify their offerings to merchants throughout the millennia. This short, nostalgic journey focuses on the rise and mostly demise of the corn exchanges across the globe. I had the pleasure of visiting the Chicago Board of Trade whilst out visiting my US partners a few years ago. We sat in the famous series Cafe and marvelled at the Art Deco of the interior and exterior of this iconic building, thinking back to the millions of traders who frequented its floors through its golden age. We even tried to sweet-talk the guard into letting us have a nose about upstairs, but without success. Sir, the upper floor is off limits. Only for authorised personnel, he sauntered, and for a split second I felt like I was back at school, abiding to the rule of the duty prefects. And of course, the United States is the world's largest market of futures and forward contracts. Famous grain and corn exchanges are also present in Minneapolis and Philadelphia. Around the globe, corn exchanges are present in Australia, Canada and Ireland, and a brief mention of an exchange in Lesotho, according to Wikipedia, as through the ages, trading is a truly global affair. And if we look towards the UK, it is hard not to notice the sheer innovation and invention of this tiny little island, such an influential nation in the bigger scheme of things, it never ceases to astound me. Hundreds of exchanges were built up and down the country between 1747 and 1869, and of which 44 still exist today. And what is critical to note is that these buildings, from an architectural standpoint, are quite breathtaking. Originally, the first exchanges were for the physical sale of commodities, such as wheat, barley and other corn crops. It isn't hard to imagine the deals that went on inside the great halls, with the subtle overtones of enterprise and forward planning. Rumours of volatile prices and the cyclic trends in supply and demand would have filled the air, and in the hundrum the merchants would have had to consider of whom psychologically it was best to believe regarding the ever-changing news, exaggerations, tall tales and fibs. I'm sure that there exists many a rags to riches story across the ages, which of course would have mostly been the other way around. From 1747 to the latter part of the 19th century, and the first covered corn exchange in London's Mark Lane, there was a rapid expansion of corn exchanges built throughout the UK. After the repeal of the Corn Laws in 1846, corn exchanges were in big demand. Sadly, with cheaper foreign imports, and thus a fall in the price of English corn, it was clear that in one generation the corn exchanges days as trading venues were truly over. The repeal of the Corn Laws are what many historians consider as a decisive shift towards free trade in Britain. The irony that an industry which thrived and invested heavily in itself was lost entirely to the very policy that had set its initial demand in motion. I can't help thinking of cryptocurrency and the verisimilitude of the currency versus commodity debate and whom should own its asset class. In respect to crypto, perhaps it will fail simply because of the paradox where the more global governments attempt to strangle its prices into submission, the more volatile its prices thus become. 
It's not unlike Brexit, where the middle ground fudged by the UK government destroys the essence of bondage it attempts to unshackle itself from. How very sad. But all being said, these beautiful buildings in the UK are a testament to the wants, desires, fears and folly of a society long gone. But what it has left behind is something tangible and wonderful to be enjoyed by everyone. Many of these buildings are used as art centres, meeting rooms and cinemas. Liverpool, I notice, has been converted into an apart hotel, whatever one of those is. The point is, look at the pictures and images I have presented here, and a big thanks to all the contributors of the history and images that can be found on Wikipedia and other related sites.